I think we should get started. I appreciate that everybody came out on this night. Um, and the, the exciting thing is that um, we'll have this videotaped so that lots and lots of people can see it, where people walked out the door tonight and saw the fog and the rain and said they're not going to be there. People have talked a lot about this program and wanted us to have it. So, um, so we're very fortunate that M. Richards is here from BCTV. And she'll be, uh, it'll be on the air and will be available around the world. So that would be great. So Ned, we're okay. really glad that you're here. Thank you. Thanks for coming sure. and thanks for doing this. Um, yeah. Okay, glad to be here. Hi, everybody. Uh, I am Ned Pokris. Uh, I'm here sort of having been dragooned into this by our local Audubon chapter, Southeastern Vermont Audubon, at one of our recent board meetings. It was brought up that you folks were interested in having this kind of a talk. And by whatever machinations happened internal to our board, it seems to have been decided that I at least knew enough to uh, come and give this presentation. Uh, you notice uh, my first slide admits that the, the photographs you're going to be seeing are not mine. If you know the name Chris Petrak, he was an extremely active member of the Southeastern Audubon Board for a couple decades at least. Uh, recently defected to Pennsylvania to be with the younger generations of his family. But he left us a flash drive with, I kid you not, 30, 35,000 files on it. <laughs> um, so I did not lack for... So I did not lack for material on this presentation. Um, it has been implied that I might say a little bit about myself uh, as, a, as a birder. Uh, I've been in the area continuously for a little over 20, under 20 years now. Uh, I've lived a number of places. I'm actually trained as a marine micropaleontologist of all things. Um, on the other hand, I'm the middle of three sons. I'd sort of been kind of interested in birds as a teenager, but never really got focused on it. Uh, but my older brother, Mark, uh, started going out with and eventually married a, an extremely avid birder. And Martha infected Mark, and they infected my younger brother, Danny. And then I was surrounded, so what could I do? Um, so, so here I am, and so what I'm going to be talking about, as you can see from the, from, from, the, from the title slide, is talking a little bit about how to attract birds to feeders, some do's and don'ts, um, and then I'll be showing a number of slides, hopefully not too voluminous a number of slides, of most of the birds you're likely to see around here at feeders. I decided, rather than inundate you with too many slides, not to show birds you might see once in a rare while. Uh, but so these are, these are going to be sort of the, the, the general most common rogue gallery for, for, the, for the most part. So first of all, what makes a feeder bird? In other words, um, why do we see certain birds at feeders and, and not others? Um, it's going to be a lot, if you, if you do everything right in terms of your bird feeder, it's going to be a quite long time before you see a great blue heron, for instance. Um, why? It has no interest in what you're trying to do. Uh, it eats the wrong things. Um, as far, not for itself, but, if, but, but for you as, you as trying to feed the birds. So generally you're going to see birds, most of it eat seeds. Uh, and secondarily, birds like some woodpeckers and things like that that eat, that eat suet, and a couple of other specialized things that you may or may not put out. Um, so you're not going to see flycatchers. Flycatchers and warblers, these are insectivorous birds. These are birds that either be up in the trees feeding or flying around snatching their, their prey out of the air. Similarly, for the same reason, you won't see swallows. Um, no great blue herons, no kingfishers, no bald eagles. Um, and then lastly, um, you might once in a while see a bird that eats birds. Uh, and I'll actually talk about that in a second, a, a particular incident we had at our, at our place recently. Oh, and if there are any questions at any point, by the way, please, please feel to break in. Um, I'm not going to go in, in excruciating detail into what to feed. But if you were to go to whatever store you buy your bird seed at, you will see a number of bags of different kinds of basically mixed seeds. Um, most of them will have some millet, some sunflowers, maybe cracked sunflowers, maybe whole sunflowers. 
um, might have corn, might have peanuts, might have a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, and if you look at the bags, probably a lot of the bags will show you different species. You know, this bird is, is attracted to these particular types of seeds. So you have some way of at least attempting to attract particular birds you want to attract by choosing the bag of, of mixed bird seed you get. Um, one of the basic realities of this is that the good stuff in terms of the things that we the birders are more interested in seeing in our feeders tends to be the more expensive seed. Um, and of course, as I said, a couple special special needs, I, sorry, that's a bad term for this. Um, a couple birds that have specific interests in what you're going to feed them. Hummingbirds are not going to come to your, to your, to your, to your thistle or your, or your millet or your cracked corn, but they're going to, they're going to want sugar water. Um, Baltimore Orioles love slices of oranges. Um, if you don't put slices of oranges around, you're not going to see Baltimore Orioles. At least I don't, I think I can say I've never seen one at our feeders because we don't tend to do that. We, um, yeah. We tried to fill a feeder with berries. If we knew what kind, would we attract some other birds? But back to that one that you showed prior to That's that. a great question I don't know the answer to. Um, I would think you might attract something like, for instance, waxwings, which are very into berries. Uh, does, has anyone ever tried that? Do we have it? Do I, we have no, a, I think they'll come group? to a platform feeder. Will they? Okay. I, th I think so. Okay. And what kind of berries would they be, yeah. too? <laughs> Anything I yeah, have berries. I, I think in terms of berries, their 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 interests are extremely wide. Yeah. So if so if you fl if you go around the neighborhood and you see you know a bush with a bunch of wax wings in it, then obviously you know they they're eating those berries. But I also think that there are birds that will be happy to eat fruit just if it's there. Mm -hmm. So yeah. uh, some of the birds that would eat seed, if they if you give them seed, if you happen to provide them with this extra goodie. Of fruit, they'll probably be happy to help themselves to it. Okay. So we may need to experiment <laughs> in a good scientific fashion. <laughs> okay. Um, so next question that occurred to me is, again, other than having the right sort of food, what can we do to make the birds want to come to our feeders? Um, birds like most of us. Your mileage may vary, but most of us are probably going to want to see a variety of birds. Guess what? Different birds have different habitats. Uh, sparrows are going to want something different than chickadees. are going to want something different than nuthatches, etc. Um, it's generally a good idea to have some shelter for them. Uh, the birds, partially because they, they might be alert that a hawk could be coming by to try to feed on them, might want to be able to fly into a nearby tree. Um, so it's kind of nice to have, to have particularly evergreen trees um, or taller shrubs around to give the birds some shelter as they're coming back and forth, as they will. Um, you'll probably want to have some, some ground feeding birds, you know, sparrows and juncos, things like that. So a nice flat area with grass is going to be appropriate for them. Um, and definitely, you're going to want to have, if you want to optimize things, you're probably going to want to have different types of feeders. Um, platform feeders may be sort of the default feeder. Um, secondarily, maybe you know, vertical tube, tube, tube feeders that birds can, can perch on and take the, take the grain out of, take the, the seed out of. Um, Thistle feeders around here, one of the species that we get is, is the American goldfinch. Goldfinches are pretty specialist. They eat, to a large extent, thistle. Um, so it's not a bad idea at all to have, to have dedicated thistle feeders. Um, hummingbird feeders, as I said, and I seem to have left off of that the suet feeders. Again, a lot of birds will come for the suet. Um, and also, lastly, um, to this point, um, it's really nice if you have some water nearby uh, for the birds to bathe in or drink in. Um, there might be a natural stream, and if not, there are, there are certainly ways that you can provide them a little pool <coughs> or a little running water during your visit. Okay. So the next area I wanted to go to is figuring out who we got. Um, 
Some of you may be very experienced birders. Some of you may be just starting out. Um, so how do we tell who is who? Um, and I've broken this down into three basic categories of ways to identify your bird. Um, and how more experienced birders prioritize these has changed somewhat over time. Um, if we went back historically to the days of the, you know, the early birders in this country, for instance, John James Audubon, people like that, they shot everything in sight. And they identified the birds from hand specimens. Um, which obviously gives you really good, insi really good insight. The bird is right there, but it's tough on the population. Um, the main, as I understand things, the main direction away from that was started by maybe one of the most famous birders in this country in most of our lifetimes, Roger Torrey Peterson. Um, if you look at birding literature, probably most of you have, or at least have, have, have seen the, the Peterson bird guy. Um, and Peterson's big breakthrough was to start to give you ways to identify the bird in the field, the actual live birds. Um, so for instance, if you looked at a birding textbook from the 1800s and a Peterson guide for the black-capped chickadee, you would see a different length on the bird because the dead specimen was all stretched out. The live specimen, Peterson's identification would be based on the length of this bird as it's standing there on this branch. Okay? The other thing he did was he focused really heavily on what we call field markings. So particularly features of color, of shape, well not even necessarily so much shape, color, um, length of wings, specific markings, you know, is, you know, so this bird, we look at this bird and we say, you know, it's got a black cap, it's got a black chin, the, the chest and the breast are not streaked, it's sort of got little faint what we call wing bars. So all those fairly, sometimes very obvious, sometimes fairly subtle distinguishing features. Um, and that's a great way to do it and probably most, I'm guessing most people these days, that's kind of where most people start out when they're identifying birds. It seems to me in a couple of bird guides coming out lately, and the one I'm really thinking of is a bird guide for shorebirds, um, is focusing somewhat more on what birders call for shorthand the jizz, which stands for the general impression of shape and size. So here's a female hairy woodpecker. Um, I would, if I'm identifying this bird, first of all, I'm identifying that it's female by sort of a Roger Tory Peterson identifi identification feature. The male would have red on the back of the head, the field male doesn't, okay? But if I, can, if I look at this bird in the, in the jizz of this versus the chickadee, number one, this is a larger bird. Obviously, you can't tell that from independent slides. I'd need two, two of them back to back. But it's got a different posture. It's got a longer bill, all that kind of stuff. And then finally, <clears throat> the behavior. So, I, so this is not what most people would think of as a feeder bird. Um, this is sort of a bird that feeds on feeder birds. Uh, this is a sharp-shinned hawk. And we actually had one visit us last week. Um, I it was about 7.30 in the morning. We had just started putting, putting seed out for the, for the winter. And I looked outside, and there were two female purple finches and one male purple finch, which I was kind of excited about because <coughs> they're not that common around here. Um, and they were in among a group of house sparrows. Um, and we have a barn. If you have a barn, you have house sparrows. House sparrows are an introduced species. They came from the United Kingdom um, some time ago. And there are birds that, that birders tend to, tend to look down on, for better or worse. Um, so I'm looking out, and I'm kind of excited, and then I just see this blur. And I look into the lilac bushes to the left of our feeders, and there is a sharp-shinned hawk eating, and I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna be prejudiced about this, eating, unfortunately, from my point of view, one of the female purple finches, rather than one of the house sparrows. Um, 
but again, identify behavior we can we can use as a key to identify which kind of which bird we're looking at. Um, does it stand up straight? Does it stand? If, again, if we go back a couple of slides, so the chickadee is perched at a fairly low angle. The hairy woodpecker is much more vertical. Um, do they feed on the ground? Do they feed on a perch upright? Do they feed on a perch upside down? Do they run? If there are ground feeders, do they run or do they hop? Um, do they have calls? Of course, calls are very important. So this would be our third, or at least my third general category of our keys, our helpful, helpful ways to figure out if we don't already know what bird it is we're looking at, okay? <clears throat> so now what I'm gonna do is just go through hopefully a reasonably modest, reasonably digestible number of slides showing, as I said, mostly the more common species we're likely to see in Wyndham County and maybe one or two of the specialties that we might be kind of hoping to see on rare occasions. Um, and they're in no particularly magical order. Um, so this is the downy woodpecker. As you can see, it's at the sewer. And I also tried to pick, pick pictures out where the birds were at particularly representative places like feeders or on the ground. So downy woodpeckers, the main reason they would, the main reason the woodpeckers would come to our feeders would be for the sewer. So again, like the hairy woodpecker, we see the red on the back of the head. We know for sure this is a male. It's smaller than the hairy woodpecker. But other than that, it's not they're not spectacularly easy to distinguish. If you only see one, of the, if you see them both together, it's pretty obvious. If you see them, if you see one but not the other, the best way to tell, at least as far as I'm concerned, is, is the size of the bill compared to the size of the, whole, of the rest of the bird. So back to the downy, the bill is really pretty short and stubby and small. The hairy, not only absolutely, but relatively compared to the size of the body, the bill is longer. Okay? Here's a red-bellied woodpecker. I'm going to answer one of the perennial questions about this bird, which is why is this not called the red-headed woodpecker? Uh, those of you who are more knowledgeable and maybe have, have lived a little bit out west of here know that there is a, that the name red-bellied, red-headed woodpecker has been usurped, actually not usurped, it's completely valid, uh, validly taken away from this guy by the fact that on the red-headed woodpecker, the entire head is red. Um, and you can't really see it on this picture, but there is sort of a reddish wash on the, on the underside, on the belly. So, the so the, yes, the name is appropriate. Um, and again, this one, it's got a very long red stripe. That, again, is telling me this bird is, is, is a male. The stripe would be shorter and just on the back if it were a female. Um, these guys, if I'd been given this talk in 1999 when I moved into the area, I might not have mentioned this bird. Uh, this is a bird that's relatively, that's quite recently come to this area. In fact, it's been moving north for several decades. Um, when I was in graduate school, I was at a laboratory that was on the Palisades, on, on north of the George Washington Bridge, literally on the New York-New Jersey line. I saw my first red-bellied woodpecker there in, I checked my, I've checked my records in 1979. And I had to look at my guidebook and I was amazed the bird was that far north. Okay. So in 1979, this bird was just getting into very, very southern New York State. Now it's breeding in this area. Mm. A question? Yeah. Is that I can't um, tell if that is a bird um, on a hedge or a bird on the ground. He's on the ground. Okay. That's a good question. Yeah. Um, and it is possible to, to if you don't see the red head well, it's possible to to mistake this guy for a flicker, yes. um, which are not really feeder birds. Uh, but if you see the flicker flying, the flicker has a really, really prominent white rear end. And they also have very different calls. 
The other thing about the red-bellied woodpecker is, from what I'm gathering, it's outcompeting the hairy woodpecker. So we seem to be getting fewer hairy woodpeckers around here because of this bird moving in on it. Yeah. Uh, well, it, it's not the only one. Um, there are several others, cardinals. Um, Meg, my partner, has, has been in Vermont far longer than I have, and, and, and she tells me that in her youth, um, when she was a kid, seeing a cardinal was a, was a major rarity. Um, so I'm trying to think what others. Uh, titmouse. Titmouse. Tit, titmouse, definitely. So tough to titmouse, which we'll see, I think, pretty shortly has moved up. Um, mockingbirds. So there are, so there are a number of birds that have definitely been moving north in that context. Um, and there are also a number of species who, 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 who were coming north early in the year. Um, but that's, I mean, that's kind of more of an environmental long-term climate change talk, which I'm not really, which is a little beyond my expertise and I'm not really set up for tonight. Um, but that, so, that, so that would be my two word answer would be climate change. The morning dove um, will sometimes come to platform feeders. Somewhat more often, though, is, 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 is going to be feeding on the ground uh, frequently in fairly large flocks, and will also sit and perch in trees and do, give, do the cool, cool cool that gives it, gives it its name. Um, back to our friend, the black-capped chickadee. Um, there are a number of species of chickadee. This is the only one we're going to get right around here. Uh, if you went up in the mountains and further, in, uh, further north in New England, you would, the black cap chickadee would tend to be displaced by the boreal chickadee. Uh, pretty, similar pretty similar color patterns, except the cap is, the cap is, is lighter color. So it's a pretty easy identification. If, on the other hand, you go very far, you go south into, I think, New Jersey at this point, Carolina chickadees, is that about how far, how north, how far north they've got? There's a species called the Carolina chickadee that looks very, very, very similar to the black cap, but has a different call. <coughs> um, another very common bird, the blue jay. Is a, has a couple things to be said about it other than the fact that it's a very brightly colored bird and something that several of us have, have said amongst ourselves is that the blue jay to us is sort of devalued by its commonness because it's a really spectacular looking bird. So imagine if you had lived in another part of the country and you came to New England and you saw your first blue jay. You'd go, wow, that's a gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous bird. Um, but we kind of... Get, get enough used to them that maybe we don't pay them as much attention as, as we might. Uh, they're very good mimics. They, they mimic um, the calls of some, some hawks, for instance. Um, and they also give warning calls. Oh, I also meant to mention something about the, about the, about the black-capped chickadee that, was, that field biologists have discovered over the last few years. So black-capped chickadees have several different calls. They've got little chips, and the one their most famous call is the, is the one, of course, that gives them the name. Yeah, you know, chicka dee 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 dee. Well, it turns out that the more D's you hear, that's a threat call. So that is a threat call, and the more D's you hear, the bigger the threat is. So if so if the bird says chicka dee dee, it's somewhat worried. If the bird goes chicka dee 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 dee, that's a really seriously worried chicken. And I think it may also have something to do with whether it's a ground predator or an or a, or a air, aerial predator, I think. Um, as we said, the toughest titmouse, um, a bird that was, again, more of a southern bird. The other there are other titmouses that exist. They're, they're further west. Um, so chickadees and titmice and blue jays, for that matter, are mostly going to be perching birds. Um, I don't know if I've ever. I'm trying to. I've been trying to remember if I've ever seen a chickadee on the ground. Um, again, one of our one of our more colorful birds we sometimes see in, in great numbers. 
the American goldfinch, the only goldfinch that's around here. Um, this is one that has sexual dimorphism, meaning the, ge the genders are different colors. So the brighter ones here are males, the duller ones are females. As you may know, very common among birds, the male wants to look spectacular to attract the female. The female wants to look unexciting so she can hang out on the nest and not have the predators come find the nest. Um, the males also have different color patterns in the winter. They're, they're, the colors are more subdued, so they have essentially a mating plume, a bright colored mating plumage when they, again, they want to impress the ladies, and a duller plumage for the winter when that's not a priority. And they perhaps, it's a way to, to be safer during sort of the off season. Um, and again, these guys love thistles. Um, that's one of the primary things they feed on. And thistles bloom later in the season than most of the other flowering plants around here do. So, so you tend to see goldfinch later in the summer into the fall than a lot of the other birds. <clears throat> As we said, another bird that's become much more common around here uh, versus several decades ago, the northern cardinal. Um, this is the male. The male is, again, another example. This is the flashier bird. Um, mostly a perching bird. Um, you may see them on the ground. These are, but these, if they're not on the feeder, usually these are skulkers. These are birds that spend most of their time in the underbrush. Uh, so you, so it's one of those birds that if you're not looking for it, um, might be easier to, to know it's there if you know the call. <coughs> Um, a little personal story on this, there, the, there's, a, there's a closely related bird that lives out in, in the western U.S. Um, called the Pyroloxia, which looks fairly similar, it's easily identifiable, but the two overlap in a very, very narrow strip down the Rockies. Um, and a number of years ago, I was in a, a picnic area in what's now Oregon Pipe National Park in very, very southern Arizona. And this, is, and this was in that strip where the two coexist. And I was so excited sit, sitting there. I was ready, getting ready to go on a backpacking trip. And I was really psyched because I had seen my first Pyroluxia. And a car from California came in with a couple who were so excited because they'd just seen their first cardinal. <laughs> but no Pyroluxias around here. Um, there are a number of sparrows. I've only selected a few that, that are particularly common. Um, the house sparrow, by the way, is not technically a sparrow. The house sparrow is, is technically what's called a weaver finch. So, so, so the other sparrows we're going to see are, are really officially, according to the American Ornithological <laughs> Unit that decides who is what, the couple or three slides we'll see are actual sparrows. So very common bird around here, the house sparrow. Um, has the streaky head, has the black whiskers, uh, has a fairly heavily streaked front of the breast, and is going to have a black, a browner black spot in the chest. And they'll be around all year, mostly in the summer, but some of them will stick around. Two that we'll see transiently. Um, that have similar names and somewhat similar looks. Here, here's a white-throated sparrow. Um, also known as the Old Sam Peabody because its call sounds like Old Sam Peabody, Peabody, Peabody. Um, these are mostly going to be on the ground. So we see this. And there are brighter versions of this and, and less brightly colored versions of this. Um, but what's going to be diagnostic is the head is going to have those stripes. This is, I, I selected a picture of a nice brightly colored one. Um, so we've got really, really sharp contrast of the, of the black and the white. Sometimes it's more dark gray and, and or dark brownish gray and, light, and lighter. Um, but it will always have that little yellow spot in front of the eye, and it will always have some kind of a, some kind of a bib under the beak. And then, oh, I thought I had, maybe I didn't put in a picture of the white crown sparrow. Um, this is a bird that, if we've been noticing, we may just be starting to see about this time of year. Um, this is one of those birds that keeps getting reclassified, again, by the experts who keep changing their minds as to what is and what is not a different species. 
If you look at older bird guides, um, you saw three or four different species of junco that back in the 70s, I think, were all lumped together into one species of junco. Um, so what was originally the yellow-eyed junco, I think, and, and the gray-eyed junco and the Oregon junco had been separate. The powers that be decided they were not official species. And as a paleontologist who has studied how species are named, it can be a really, really tricky, complicated b business deciding what is and what is not a valid, is, is really a separate species. Um, so maybe someday there'll be three or four juncos back together pe because people will change their minds again. Um, this is sometimes called, sometimes called the snowbird. It's, it's one that comes around here in the winter. Um, this is a really typical one in terms of the color pattern. So it's got the light colored beak, the sort of almost coal gray to black top, white breast, and you can see if you look at the tail, the outer tail feathers are nice bright white. So if you flush one of these, and, and these will be either on the ground or usually in lower brush. So if you flush one of these and you see the really prominent white flash on either, either side of the tail, that's a really good field indicator. Many of them, though, will be more brownish, chocolate brown, and not as, bright, not as clearly white underneath as well. So this is a species. So unlike the chickadee, you see 20 chickadees, it's hard to tell which is which. You see 20 of these guys, you might be able to tell which one is which much more easily because there's more individual variation in the color patterns. We get two types of finches around here, the house finch and the purple finch. Here's a male house finch. Obviously at a, at a vertical feeder, showing down. Um, you notice it's got bright red on the head, down the chest, but then if you look underneath on the belly, you see some streaking on the belly, and that's brown and white. If you look at the purple finch, female on the right, male on the left. And now if you look closely at, at the male's belly, you see it's reddish purplish all the way down. One of my partners, Meg's favorite birds, the roast-breasted grosbeak. Again, male on the, on the left, female on the right. Um, that almost blood red streak down, down the chest, which will look different in different birds, so that's something sometimes you can, you can tell which of these guys is which. Um, these are migrants. Most of the birds we've seen so far are around most of the year, if not all of the year. These are definitely migrants that come up in the south for the breeding season and then head back on south. So for us, when, when the first roast-breasted grosbeaks show up in the spring, that's kind of a landmark for us. Related species, the evening grosbeak. Um, again, a fairly large feeder bird. Um, like the rose breast, it is usually going to be on the platform feeders. <coughs> this spectacular yellow and black and white plumage. Um, and this is a bird that around here is not nearly as common as it used to be, and I don't think we have any particular sense as to why. Um, Meg says when she was younger, um, her father would call them bandits because they'd put a bunch of bird seed into the feeder mm -hmm. and 20 or 30 or 40 of them would come out of nowhere and completely deplete the feeder and then be gone. Um, I would say in a good year recently we see two or three of them maybe a couple times. Um, and that seems to be the trend around here. Um, again, they're in northern Vermont, right? Yeah, they're, yeah, so yeah they're, they are definitely more northern birds, yeah. that, yes. But why they're not coming as far south as any, so is that also because of, because of climate change? Is it getting too warm for them down here, even seasonally? I, I have not heard any particular definitive information on that. I think it's the Burlington nightlife. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, could be. Um, but, 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 you know, again, you know, one thing that strikes me, and, and I'm going to show sort of what happens to you when you study geology for a long time, you, th you get used to thinking in, in millions and hundreds of millions of years, and I think of how long we've really been studying birds. Yeah. 
100 years, 150 years. So what do we really know about all these small scale changes that have probably been going on all the time and probably have been going on for centuries and millennia? So is this a climate related thing or is this some kind of a cycle or oscillation that may turn around in five or 10 or 20 years? Who knows? I don't have an answer on that one. Um, another bird that not everybody is fond of, the brown-headed cowbird. Um, cowbirds have a really interesting reproductive strategy that, does, that is somewhat obsolete for them. Uh, cowbirds evolved to follow the buffalo when the plains were full of bison. And so, what, so, they be, so cowbirds evolved to be what are called brood parasites. So the cowbird lays their eggs in the, in the nests of other species, and frequently smaller birds. And what will frequently happen is the, the cowbird chick will kill or toss out of the nest the chick of the other bird, um, and, the other, and, the mother, and the mother of the other species will then feed the cowbird. Because once the cowbirds had laid their eggs, if, if they were traditional nesters, they lay their eggs they can't incubate the eggs where they are because the bison are now 500 miles away because the bison have moved. So, so the evolutionary strategy seems to have seems to have been predicated, seems to have been necessitated by their following the buffalo. They could not survive by laying, by building a sort of a conventional nest on the ground and sitting on it for several weeks. Foster parents. Hmm? Foster parents. Yeah. Well, yeah. The Baltimore Oriole, another one that is, that, is, that is a migrator from the south, and another one that has been tossed around taxonomically by the American Ornithological Union. When I first bought my first bird guides, there was the Baltimore Oriole, and there was a, a closely related species called the Bullock's Oriole. And then again, I think back about in the 1970s, the American Ornithological Union decided they weren't separate species. So the two were lumped together into what they called the Northern Oriole, because they had to have a different name for it. And then they were split back apart. Um, so beautiful birds. Again, this, was an, uh, this is on suet. I don't recall seeing Orioles on suet very much. Um, but my impression is the, is the best way to attract Orioles around here, like we said, is, 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 with, is you just nail orange slices up onto trees or something like that. Um, the female is sort of a more subtly ver colored version of the same bird. But one of the interesting things about the female is the female is, the Baltimore Oriole is one of the few species where the female actually also has a call. And it is different than, than the male, so you can tell them apart that way. Would they come if you just put orange slices on an outside table? I don't know. Um, it, again, they're, I at least think of them as perchers, so, so I don't know if they're really, if they're really adapted to, to standing on the ground and hopping around or walking around. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But they're pretty enthused about oranges. Yeah. <laughs> yes, but they definitely like oranges, as she said. Yes, this picture is is, is straight up. Uh, this is this is so there are two species of nuthatch around here. This is the white-breasted nuthatch, for what will be reasonably obvious reasons. Um, this is a bird that hops up and down trees, frequently upside down, um, and will probe under the bark with its long, slightly slightly curved beak. Um, very common feeder birds, and they tend to like hardwoods. <clears throat> so for instance, we on our property, we have mostly hardwoods around, so we get white-breasted nuthatches at our feeder. Our neighbors across the street, who are also very avid birders, have pine trees. And so they get what we get very, very, very infrequently, the red-breasted nuthatch, which prefers coniferous trees. It's a little bit smaller, maybe a little bit chunkier. Um, see, it's got that very prominent eye stripe. It is definitely a shorter squatter bird, and you see it's got that kind of reddish rust-colored wash underneath.
and perhaps serious birders, least favorite bird in this country. Again, at the risk of being prejudiced, this is the European starling. Um, the starling is an inferior species. The starling, as the name implies, it comes from Europe. Um, and, this, and the reason the starling exists in this country is that somebody back in the 1800s decided he wanted to bring all the species mentioned in Shakespeare to, was it New York or Boston? I think it was New York. And the one that survived is the European starling. This is a very adaptable bird. Um, this is a bird that will outcompete a lot of other stuff. This is a bird that does not have a lot of natural predators. Uh, so starlings have reproduced into astronomical numbers. Um, if you look at, for those of you who know about the Christmas count, so in a couple of weeks, people around here are going to go out into the woods and look at every bird we, and, and notate every bird that we can find by species and by number. That's done all, all over the country and, in fact, all over the Americas now. Um, if you look at Christmas counts from places in the, in the fairly deep south, um, you might see numbers, and I'm sort of making these up, but I'm not really exaggerating significantly. Um, you know, 73 Carol Carolina chickadees, uh, 14 song sparrows, you know, three of this, 92 of that, seven of these, 82 of that, 250,000 starlings. <laughs> and they're pests because they, they show up in such large numbers and they defecate and they can be a health hazard and, pe and people down there have tried all sorts of things to control the numbers um, and they seem to be out competing as far as I'm aware, everything anybody has tried to throw in their way. Uh, but they are definitely around here. <coughs> Something a little different. Again, there are a number of species of hummingbird. The only one that we see in the east is, is you can see, the ruby-throated. This is a male. Not too hard, may I suggest, to figure out where this bird's name come from. <coughs> and that is iridescence. That's not actually red pigment. That's iridescence. So if you see it in the wrong light, it doesn't look red. But again, so these guys are very specialized. They're small. They're very aggressive birds. They're very territorial birds. Um, and they feed on nectar from flowers. So what you can give them is you can give them sugar water in a feeder like that. Do they overwinter? No. No. No, they, yeah, all, no hummingbirds overwinter. Just nearly. I, I don't know. Maybe in southern Arizona? Yeah, probably in southern Arizona, but probably not. I wouldn't think. It, maybe South uh, Texas. Yeah, so, may, so maybe the very, very southern tier of the U.S., any of the hummingbirds. But a gazillion other hummingbirds cross the, cross the Gulf and then come back in April. Yeah, yeah, and, th and that is one of the amazing things about it. So this teeny tiny bird that weighs, what, a couple of grams flies across the Gulf of Mexico nonstop. One way each, each year. And I guess I couldn't bring myself to, I thought I had a slide of the, of, of the house sparrow. Maybe I couldn't bring myself to do it. Um, <laughs> so some other general, to wrap up, again, some other generalized do and don'ts. Um, so around here, probably most of you have heard that bears are a problem. Um, bears definitely will raid bird feeders very, very happily. Um, but there's a seasonality to them. So the, the standard set by the state is to recommend, and this, and this is not codified into law, I'm pretty sure I checked the internet, uh, it's a recommendation rather, rather than a legal requirement, but you should not put your feeder up until about December 1st, and you shouldn't leave it up beyond April 1st uh, to discourage bears. And the bears are out, they just decimated all my feeders Friday ah. night. Oh, still, okay, yeah. Yeah, definitely, and yeah. my neighbors too, so I know it's Okay, there. yeah. Um, it, but it was, it's been fairly warm lately, yeah. Yeah, and apparently that's going to change. It looks like we have a cold snap coming up, so, so maybe, maybe that will put them to ground. Um, there, are, there have been cases where, where birds, especially birds that, that show up in flocks, have gotten diseases like, like pink eye, conjunctivitis, from contaminated bird feeders, so it's a great idea to clean your feeder periodically. Um, the, oh, the always challenging issue of squirrels, Squirrels are pretty resourceful little individuals. Um, so most people buy cages, buy, buy vertical feeders with cages around them. Our suet feeder has a cage. Um, our vertical feeder has a cage. 
Uh, we're reasonably good at keeping squirrels out. People have done things like put their feeders on, on, on long poles and put a phonograph record under the pole so the squirrel can't get around it. Um, unless you really want to feed the squirrel, you know, I, and I'm not going to pass moral judgment on that, but if, if, if you want to get, keep your feed, your feed going, to the, going to the birds rather than squirrels, try to find something. By the way, if you've, if you've got either, either platform feeders or vertical tubular feeders, don't worry about putting stuff on the ground. The birds that feed at those feeders will always knock enough stuff down that the birds that are actually on the ground, I think, will be very well supplied. Was your hand up? Mine? Yeah, yeah, okay, I guess maybe not. Okay. Um, and I've heard some instances, including from my father uh, when we lived in, in Connecticut, um, we had feeders outside the house and there was a big long limb on a, on a maple tree outside of, outside, of, outside of our picture window in the living room and I think it was a cardinal kept flying into the window. Why was the cardinal flying into the window? Because the cardinal saw the reflection and thought it was another cardinal and was being territorial and was attacking it and, and dad complained to somebody else you know, said you know, what can I do about this and then somebody else said cut down the limb. Um, and finally the, the, the thing I, I feel a little sensitive about, um, I adore cats, um, but, our, but our cat is an indoor cat for a variety of reasons, but one of those is that cats, regardless of whether they're feral cats or domestic cats that have access to the outside, eat a lot of birds. Um, and so our, our recommendation is gonna be that please try to keep your cats inside for the benefit of the, water, of the other wildlife. And I think that is what I got. So what are, any questions? Any other questions, I should say. Okay. Yeah. I, I have this feeling that the nut hatches are really fast. They're kind of ballistic shape. They all, I'll, I'll see them swoop by and mm -hmm. then come back into the feeder. But uh, are, are they fast? Is that part of their feeding or is that part of their nature? My impression would be, I hadn't really thought of that, but my impression would be they're pretty quick little guys. Yeah. yeah. And that may be an adaptive strategy to, to try to make it harder for the sharp-shinned hawks and things like that. There was a, there's an Audubon uh, presentation, I don't know, maybe six months, uh, quite a while ago, about screech owls. Okay. And, huh. and they had some wonderful pictures, and they showed us how to make a screech owl box. Yeah. How, how compatible would that be with a bunch of songbirds or feeder birds? Um, let me tell you a screech owl story. Uh, my older brother, Mark, who I mentioned, um, became a wildlife veterinarian. Uh, Mark knows more about loon mortality maybe than anybody else in the world. But before Mark went to, went to vet school, he and his wife, Martha, had a, an avian rehabilitation center just north of Atlantic City as they were teaching at a college down, at, down in down in, 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 on the coast in, in Stockton, New Jersey. Um, and they had a screech owl that was impregnated on them. Uh, not, not impregnated, that it, it was imprinted on them, Oscar. So I forget whether they'd gotten Oscar as an egg or as a new, new hatchling, and Oscar was imprinted on Mark and Martha. And Oscar would bring them presents. But he brought them crickets and lizards and things like that. I don't think screech owls really go for, I don't think screech owls are big enough to prey on other birds. Any, yeah, yeah. So larger, so larger, plus, you know, plus they're pretty nocturnal, you know, they, they will, some, you know, you'll sometimes be able to hear them call or even see them in the day, but they're not, I'm pretty sure they're not going to be praying, praying during the day. But hawks are another matter. And I actually, when we had this incident, because there's, there's a slightly larger hawk, hawk the, the Cooper's hawk, that are, so Cooper's hawks and sharp chin hawks look very similar and they're notoriously difficult to, 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 to tell apart. And we got a really good at this Sharpie because he was standing there for 10 or 15 minutes at least eating the, eating, eating the, eating the finch. But then I went and I looked at, looked at several books or, or, or websites and it seemed to indicate that the, the larger Cooper's hawk is pretty much a, 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 an ambush hunter. It sits on a branch in, in, in the woods and waits for somebody to fly by and then goes out and gets it was the Sharpie will swoop in to something like a feeder. I have a question. Yes. Um, I heard recently, well, 
it was an argument. argument. So I'm, I'm not going to hold you to this. Um, we have a, I, I keep a brush pile, mm -hmm. right? and I and I, I try to mash it up pretty well and, and compost it eventually. It's a slow, um, a slow um, uh, compost mm -hmm. pile, and and um, my wife doesn't think it's very you know, pretty to look at. And, <laughs> And I read recently something said um, that the brush uh, brush pile on your you know in the back of your yard or something mm -hmm. is a very good um, thing to do for for birds so that they can have some cover mm -hmm. in the nooks and crannies mm -hmm. down below and it's difficult for you know, mm -hmm. something like a cat or something to kind of get in there. Amidst all of those, I, I would probably agree with all of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in fact, again, a l little personal anecdote: a number of years ago, Meg and I were down at a, at a in, a, in southern Arizona in the spring doing some birding, and we're very at a very famous uh, birding site called Patagonia, not to be confused with the other Patagonia in South America. And as we're walking along one of the trails, there is a bench, and they have benches set up so you can, you know, at appropriate habitat. And there was a bench set up in front of a in front of a brush pile. Um, I don't know, just for economy's sake, I guess I've always bought huge bags of black oil sunflower seeds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I get Finch and everybody else. Yeah. I mean, am I denying? Uh, Bob Engels had once said that the problem with what I was doing, if there was a problem, was that it required more energy to take the... Uh, to open the nut? To take it, uh. right. And that energy lost, <clears throat> especially in the winter, yeah. was uh, a bit, you know. Yeah. So, so one answer, one answer, and one non-answer. Yeah. Uh, so, what I what I would walk a little bit out on the limb toward the feeder would be to say probably if that's all you're buying, you're losing some species because you're not you don't have really? cracked corn peanuts or stuff like that. I'm guessing. Like what? Like, like, again, like, like, like pieces of peanut or like pieces no, of crack. No, but what am I losing? Oh, oh um, species. different species no. that have different that have different that have different different yeah. eating habitats. In terms, in terms, in terms of the in terms of the energy efficiency of, of having to open up the seed, um, all I'm going to say is Bob is a trained field biologist, yeah. and, I, and I and I'm trained to st to look at dead things. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Yeah. <clears throat> I feel like there's, there's a real, right now we have three major birds that are coming. Uh, chickadees, tet mice, and uh, nut hatches. And there seems to be a real pecking order. The, the, mm -hmm. the, the chickadee will be there, but if a, a nut hatch comes in, the chickadee will disappear. And if the tit mouse comes mm -hmm. in, everything else disappears. Is that is that, uh, out? Is that that sounds like something I'm going to have to keep a closer eye on. To see. Uh, it, it, it may well be. I mean, they're definitely more aggressive and, and less aggressive birds. Um, again, anecdotally, I remember m many years ago, Mark, my brother, had a banding station down in New Jersey, and, and I and I helped him <coughs> once. I helped him band birds, and so we were taking the birds out of the out of the mist net, and most of the birds were just kind of flopped there fairly passively, but I remember the, the tit mice and I think also the chickadees would actually peck at you and, and, and take exception to what was going on. Yeah. Hmm. Also, the, the three kinds of birds you mentioned uh, very often will form a feeding flock. Yes, right. Yeah. So if you go out in the woods in the winter, yeah, right. mm -hmm. <coughs> very often you will find a group of a mixed species group mm -hmm. that is sort of traveling together. Yeah. And there's been a lot of research on why they do that. One of the things that's suggested is that they're not competing often directly right. for food. So for example, the nuthatches are looking yeah. under the bark, yeah. mm -hmm. whereas the chickadees are looking for something else. Right. But they provide warnings for each other. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. And so you'll often see these mixed species flocks mm -hmm. traveling. Yeah. So if you, and that the three you mentioned are a common mix. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, because so there may be a dominance thing there, but they also tend to band mm -hmm. together yeah. to warn each other about mm -hmm. dangerous birders and, and 
clocks and whatnot. <laughs> yes? The figures, how would you clean them between seasons? I take them, I take them down in the summer and then um, you know, put them back up in the winter. Do they um, have to be sterilized or? I, I don't think you need to throw it in autoclave, but probably soap and warm water would, would do fine. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think I mean e e even if you've got one of the one of those vertical feeders with the bars on it, things like that. Even just even just rinsing it out and, and flushing it out and getting all that gunked up, you know, the remains of the of the seeds that have sort of, sort of decayed in there, will be, will put you way ahead of the game. I've read that bleach, bleach? and water okay. is another good thing. Okay. Very, very uh, yeah. diluted. Mm -hmm. Very, very diluted. Yeah, from the back. Um, I've been feeding around here, right up the street, for many years, and for some reason, I'm not getting any chickadees this year. Huh. I don't know if anybody has had seen a decrease in their chickadee population, but I have like two chickadees come like twice a day right now. It's like, where did they go? No, huh? no. I, 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 what, what I've noticed personally is we have almost nothing for downy and hairy woodpeckers around us. Mm -hmm. But we may have a complication there in that we have 70 acres of woods above on our property, and most of that was logged not this past winter but the winter before. Mm -hmm. So we may have lost the, you know, the dead trees that the, that the, that the woodpeckers. Are relying on. I do. I do think. It, it, and again, back back to back to the back to the larger woodpeckers. It is definitely my understanding that the red-bellied is outcompeting the hairy. But I don't think there would be as much what what an ecologist would call niche overlap. So overlap in the specific uh, environmental needs of the of the larger woodpeckers versus like the hairies. But uh, but back to your question. No, I had I had not noticed. I haven't noticed all that many birds in general. But we definitely have. have a reasonable representation of chickadees. Okay, so 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 one other thing that, that I actually meant to mention in terms of so in terms of this time of year and so are you talking about the last few weeks or are you talking about all year? No, the last. I, mean, I put my feeders out a little early, so the last month. Or so. Okay, so the other thing that may be happening in gen and I know you're you're focusing on one species and so there may be something specific to the chickadees, but in general, like when we do the Christmas count. And a lot of the places we go every year are bird feeders because guess what? We're looking for birds. Um, if there's snow on the ground and if it's cold, there are a lot more birds at the bird feeders than if it's warm and everything's open. So they may just so there may be something going on, or they may just be dispersed because because there's no stress bringing them into the feeder. So are bears already hibernating? Um, apparently not. From what <laughs> from what Felicity said. Friday night. Yeah. <laughs> I live off of Black Mountain Road. Yeah. And Friday night, and it was uh, actually my neighbor <coughs> came down the next day, and they told me they saw him, him or her, mm -hmm. uh, decimate that, there. That yeah. yeah. And and mine was just the limb of the crab apple tree was cracked. So he wanted to get to the feeder, and it was too oh. much of a stretch, I guess. So he took the whole limb off the tree. So we shouldn't have the feeders out already. I, I put them out, and it's, I'm taking. I mean, I've got. <coughs> Yeah, I, I, I guess officially we're kind of right on the bubble, but again, if it is going to cool down in the next few days, and you know, it looks like the next week we may be looking at highs in the 20s, so I would think that would change the bear's mind as to whether they're going to be out or not. There's been a lot of a lot of feed available, all sorts of feed. Yeah, also true. Uh, and uh, I think that sometimes keeps the bears. Um, happy and fat. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. But I don't know enough about bears to know how much of it is their biological clock as the light reduces and how much of it is just the feed that's still out there. Yeah. And how much of it's the weather. Yeah. Right. 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 It's yeah. a good acorn year. Yeah. Bears eat acorns. <clears throat> so they've got a good food source that's fairly rich and still out there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It hasn't been that cold. Right. It hasn't been that snowy. Yeah, yeah. So I, th I, I, my general sense, and this may be a little, a little pushing my real knowledge, is that they will stay out as much as, as long as it's to the benefit, and they'll be adaptive enough that if, if it stays warm and there's a good mast crop, then they'll take care, take advantage of it. Um, yeah, your hand is up first. Um, kind of a 
an, an interesting setup in that we're, we're in uh, in the middle of Brattleboro, mm -hmm. but um, we're on Spruce Street and our property backs up to the mm -hmm. retreat trails. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. yeah. So we're right on the edge of, you know, in the, the development. Mm -hmm. and we have a pretty good slice of woods behind. And um, I had put out feeders often in the past, but in my, in, I, I'm going to try to um, bring more birds come in. Mm -hmm. And um, in the past, I've been hanging them. We, we have a zip line, uh -huh. and I've been hanging feeders on the zip line, and they're pretty, they're, they're spaced out pretty mm -hmm. widely. Um, and I'm wondering if, you know, if, if you have a cluster of feeders that are all, you know, closer than that. Mm -hmm. Do you get um, do, you, do you get a kind of a, a, a multiplier effect? I mean, I don't know. Not that, not that I'm aware of. Maybe it's just yeah. that I'm not seeing them because, mm -hmm. up, you know, up, up the yeah. back window it's farther to see than up yeah. the side mm -hmm. window. Yeah, I, I I don't think I really have an answer to that. One. Well, a lot of people say, as, as you did, that um, they put their feeders out during the day and take them in at yeah, night. Also, right. And while um, uh, in the past when our feeders were destroyed, it was usually at night, mm -hmm. the only time I've seen bears has been in the daytime. Mm -hmm. So they are out day and night, yeah. and, and yeah. that, that does right. not yeah. keep them from uh, right. yeah. coming to your feeder. <laughs> yeah. We had a bear all last winter. In, uh, our, in our huh. neighborhood, there was a bear huh. that was seen constantly. This past winter, not the, yeah. not the winter, yeah. not the only didn't winter. Didn't go to bed okay. or huh. Curious. something. Yeah. Wow. 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 Well, I know I've seen tracks, like when we've had a, a, a good January thaw. Yeah. I've right. seen bear tracks yeah. where the bears appear to have been gone, and then you have a warm period, and they're, yep. they're out again. And then they seem to disappear again when it, when it got cold. So. You know, I, I think <clears throat> I don't know if anybody has studied how how often they are willing to wake up, but it does seem to happen sometimes with the weather. I have a vague sense that it has been studied, but I don't know the answer to the question. Yeah. So a few years ago, um, this was when well, I've been taking my bird feeders down the summer painfully. <laughs> for quite a few years because of bears, but I was still feeding them in the summer. And a female, mature female sharpshin came and spent some time with what must have been her juvenile hmm. offspring. Okay. And she was teaching him how to pick birds off <laughs> the, the feeding stations. Mm -hmm. And they spent quite a bit of time, a couple of hours over time, they would come and go. And he was not very good at it, the, the, the juvenile. But uh, she would just sit and just give him the opportunity to practice. Mm. It's very interesting. I've never oh. seen that again. Yeah. Um, well, what about the birds? The birds, well, the birds have a very short attention span. <laughs> I think that um, what the hawks were doing were just getting in brush. Yeah waiting long enough for the mm -hmm. birds to start coming back, which yeah. isn't very long. No, right. And until finally, I don't know whether it ended because the hawks got tired or because the, the, the feeder birds decided yeah. that it was, really wasn't safe yeah. after all. Yeah. Yeah, one other, one other thing about birds at feeders perceiving a threat is something like, for instance, this experience we had the birds had scattered shortly before I saw the blur of, of, of the hawk come in. But sometimes what you'll see is you'll see a bird at a feeder or on a branch near the feeder just standing stock still for minutes at a time. Mm -hmm. And that says mm -hmm. that bird is perceiving a threat. That mm -hmm. bird does not want to move because it's afraid it will be noticed. Do you have problems with crows around your feeders? My next door neighbor 
buys these monstrous bags of peanuts and feeds her crows every morning. <laughs> Not and, uh, you know, I can't put my feet around without huh. crows descending on it. Huh. Years ago, my father tried putting out a um, bunch of, for some reason we had a bunch of stale bread or something, and <coughs> tried putting out big, fairly big chunks of, of crumbs, and we had crows show up for that. Mm. But they didn't really come back. I, mm. I presume that the little seeds are somehow too small for them. At least that's my, that's my guess. I know that the, the one time we had crows show up, it was when we had big chunks of stuff out do you, there. Do you think they come to prey on the birds rather than to share in the food? Do they prey on? I don't think so. Lunch, they they will take season. nestlings yeah. Yeah, during right. the nesting season, uh, but yeah. I don't think, I don't know. John, do you have, I mean, what do you think? Do you think crows would Prey on feeder birds? Uh, ravens will. Yeah. Ravens. Mm -hmm. ravens will take, especially recently fledged birds and aren't mm -hmm. too good at flying. Okay. Pick them right out of the air, mm -hmm. but oh. not so much crows, I don't think. Maybe opportunistically. Mm -hmm. Ravens do it routine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We've got a family of about five or six crows at our house mm -hmm. every single, all year, mm -hmm. constantly. And I've never seen them go after any of our birds or chipmunks or anything. And they come, they like the cracked corn, the big chunk mm -hmm. corn. Okay. So I put that out now for the turkeys because the turkeys are coming mm -hmm. and the crows are coming for the corn. Uh, one question just for the audience in general is, has anyone had bluebirds coming to their feeders in the winter? Week. Really? Yeah. I, I didn't, I don't know if it was at the, I didn't see, I can't say that I saw the bird at the feeder, but mm -hmm. there were three bluebirds that came in yeah. and they were hanging out mm -hmm. again in the crab apple and this other tree where the feeders were. They did not, I didn't see them eat, mm -hmm. but I was surprised. I've never, yeah. I've seen them in my woods, but yeah. I've never seen them sitting right out there. They kind of saw it, won't they? I don't yeah. think they saw it out. Yeah. Um, they were coming to my feeders all last winter. I'd see three or four. Huh. Mm. Oh, yeah. someone told me. News, wow. news to me. Were they all males? No. Uh, two or three males and a couple of females. Yeah. Um, maybe they're learning something new. <laughs> <laughs> do you have nest boxes around? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I do too, and I think that attracts them sometimes in the winter. Yeah, could be. But I've never seen it. Overnight and yeah. Could be. It's fun to see them. Oh, yeah, yeah definitely. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah.